research. Why talk about research before we even talk about getting started on the writing? <clears throat> before we even talk about choosing a story? Well, the term research is used all the time and it's almost always referred to as research. That is, that's the only term that's used. I've, I've listened to dozens of other writers talk about this and it's just the term of art. I started writing in 1996, which is when I was in graduate school, but I was in graduate school at Georgetown doing national security and then later doing studies in international affairs. I wasn't in graduate school for writing. I don't have an MFA. When we talked about research as a social sci as social scientists, we were talking about the creation of new knowledge. So when scientists of any kind in any subject area talk about um, doing research, they're talking about putting together a research design and the executing it that is going to uh, reveal something new in the universe or create something new uh, in the world, a new kind of understanding or interpretation of a phenomenon. So research is going from, from humanity not knowing something to humanity now knowing something. Now, it might be a very modest gain, and it usually is, but that's, that's how that process is ideally meant to work. Novelist writers don't do that. That's not what we, we don't create new novel. We might occasionally stumble on something. We might discover something. We might be rummaging around through an archive and help correct a public perception of something. I'm not saying that new knowledge cannot be created through the through uh, investigations that are directed towards creating a novel. They might, but it's not what you're doing. What you're doing is writing a story. To get there, there needs to be learning because stuff has to go into your brain in order for it to come out as a story. So let's use some more words. What most uh, writers are doing is not original research. What you're doing is homework. It's not a romantic word. It's not an exciting word. It's not the kind of thing you want to tell people that you're doing. It doesn't it doesn't lend itself to that sort of Indiana Jones quality. Oh, I'm doing research for a novel. It sounds great. What you're really doing is educating yourself. And upon being educated, you have not yet contributed anything to the wider world. It's a bit like saying that you're cracking open an atlas in order to... what What's an atlas? Okay, go to Google Maps. You know, in order to, to, to learn something about, you know, I don't know, Western Sudan and you're not you're not researching you're just learning stuff that's not a bad thing it's just let's separate these things out the homework that you do is generally speaking going to fall into two different categories the first one is a process uh, which is a French word and it really shouldn't have an ing on the end but it's to reconnoiter right reconnoitering which we, it's not a very, it's not a, it's not a gainly term. But to reconnoiter is to wander around in a space where there's information and openly begin to take in impressions and not even yet find patterns in it, but just familiarize yourself with a universe. So a perfect example of this would be uh, if you're going to write a historical novel and it's set in 1942 and you have decided that you're very interested in Hartford, Connecticut of 1942 and or better yet, 1938, 1938, Hartford, Connecticut. Why? Why is that interesting? Well, the largest storm hurricane in American history uh, um, hit Long Island, and then Connecticut in 1938. Took down over 2 billion trees, more than 600 dead. Uh, it was called the Hurricane of 1938 because at the time they hadn't named them. Nobody's heard of it. Nobody knows it. Let's say you're kind of interested in this. Well, what do you do? Um, one thing you can do is start reading local newspapers. You can read national newspapers, but local ones tend to be very, very interesting because there was a rich world of local newspapers at that time. 
So the Hartford Current, um, maybe further north, you have the Fitchburg Sentinel. You have the New York Times, of course, which becomes a national newspaper, but it's just a little bit further south. Boston Globe, which is a regional newspaper that's been around since the early 1800s or so. And the um, and you can get these on newspaper.com, by the way. Uh, no, I don't get money from them, but they're fantastic. They are a fantastic resource, like 100 bucks a year, and it's well worth it. So you just start reading openly. You don't even know your story yet. You don't, you don't know what's going on. You, don't, you have no idea. And I was doing this I, for, for, for my uh, forthcoming book, Twilight Crimes. And in there, I found an advertisement, or at least a paid announcement, from the Colt Armory, because Colt weapons, Colt uh, firearms, were produced in Hartford, Connecticut. And it turned out that the Colt Armory put out a thank you letter to the people of Hartford for their efforts to come to the uh, Hartford Armory, collect boxes and boxes and boxes of weapons, and move them to an off-site storage facility further away from where the storm was. That was fascinating because it visualizes it. Hundreds of men, they're all gonna be men at this time, hundreds of men carrying thousands of firearms, like, like ants, for, because they were asked to, because for, to help out as the winds are starting to pick up and the rain is starting to come in and the river, because the Hartford Armory is, is on a river, as the dikes start to, as, as it starts to build up and the water starts to come in. You've already got, you don't have a story yet, but you have a mood, you have images, you have a uh, you have sense of action, the sense of possibility. Story might come, somebody starts stealing those boxes and somebody has to figure out what to do about it. That wasn't my story, but the possibilities are endless. So this process where you reconnoiter, where you just begin to indwell, you might say, in the material, you read about it, you read the newspapers, you read other novels that were written at the time, you listen to music from that period of time, you, you look at the fashions, you go find out what was on sale at Woolworths or Sears. Um, you just, you don't have an idea yet. What you're doing is you're just taking the world in. This is absolutely essential. And even if you're writing science fiction, even if you're writing a space opera, right? Obviously, you're not going to investigate Cygnus X-1, but you can begin to read what's, what's on the minds of physicists these days. What are some of the new theories in cosmology? How else can you imagine ideas of propulsion or dealing with problems of inertia or dealing with, it? again, the possibilities are endless. But to get yourself, what does that do? Get yourself into it. What does it do? It gives you characters, it gives you characterization, it gives you vocabulary because language changes, not science fiction stuff so much, but the historical fiction or other places. Uh, how did people talk? How did they think? How did they describe things? There was a time when women used to curtsy. There was a time when women used to uh, uh, swoon. They don't do that anymore, but swooning might be in your future because it was in your past. There is a universe of, of words and deeds that are going to be essential for you to mobilize as resources in the production of a story. You don't have a story yet, but you're now immersed in the world. And the first thing you really want to do here is say, do I want to dwell in this world for the next one, two, three years of my life? Because you're going to be spending a lot of time there. I spent a lot of time in Hartford in 1938, and then the Catskills in 1942, and in Iceland uh, in, in 19, I guess it was 41, I have to check my notes, um, learned a lot about bombers and German submarines, and there was just, I had to immerse myself in that. If you don't want to be there, that's not the book you should be writing. You might want to read it, but it reminds me of a, of a of a bit of a joke that uh, Seinfeld once said. When he finished up the show, he was asked why it is he doesn't make movies. And he said, if you go to a bad movie, it's two hours. If you're in a bad movie, it's two years. Well, it's kind of like that with reading and writing. 
right? A book that you don't like, it's a week, right? Writing a book that you ultimately don't like, that could be two years. So that process where you reconnoiter and you dwell inside that material, ask if it's sparking your imagination, if it's, spark, it's, if it's touching your heart. If it is, then you might want to spend a lot of time in there. And if you do, that is, I don't know how, Stephen King just insists that it's telepathy. And at this point, I'm fine with that. But somehow or other, your love of the material translates onto the page. And from the page, it goes into the mind of the reader. I can tell, and I don't know why, I, I, I really can't, but I can tell that there are paragraphs where I'm just not really into it, where I'm treating it as perfunctory, as a way to get from point A to point C, and I realize I just have to pass through an airport at B, but God, I just hate the airport and the airport scene and the airport activity, and I don't like the idea of being at the airport, and that's all me, and somehow or other, it's ending up as an incredibly flat piece of writing for half a page. Um, you don't, and so you got to fix that. But so that part where you reconnoiter. Now, I said there was a second part to all this. That's where you've started to just roll around in it, roll around in knowledge. The second kind of homework that you do is purposive. It has purpose. It's directed. It, it's reaching out. There's something you need to know now. Give you an example. I have a forthcoming novel called Radio Life. It's not out yet. I am already writing the sequel to this book that has never been reviewed and hasn't been published and doesn't really even have foreign rights acquired. And I might be wasting my time in the most profound kind of way. I have no idea what the future is, but I'm doing it anyway because I really, really like the story. And I've mostly come up with a story partly stolen from or borrowed from, I'll give him credit, from a passage in Thucydides. History of the Peloponnesian War. And it really has been with me for 20 years. And I just thought, God, that would make a great story. Now I finally found a vehicle for taking some of his plot ideas, well, ostensibly the history that he wrote, and uh, using it as a, um, as a part of a drama in Radio Life 2, which doesn't have a name yet. So in, in Radio Life 2, I've realized that some of the structures that would likely still be standing 400 years after humanity basically is wiped off the planet, after the steel towers fall and the Eiffel Tower has gone down, everything's rusted and rotted and fallen to disrepair, and the underground stuff is mostly buried or unfindable, what's going to be still standing and remain? Well, interestingly, castles. Yes, European style fortresses and castles. There are other places in the world that have them, but the Europeans really did it best. There are castles that are still standing that were made in the 1400s that are still doing fine. They're not overtaken by, uh, by growth and vegetation and other things. They need a certain amount of upkeep, but not that much. And they are obviously on high lands, fortified, and easy to defend and all that stuff. It's a castle. It, they do castle things. And so I started realizing once I got the after reconnoitering and wondering about buildings and structures and deciding that actually that sort of bringing together in a very realistic way fantasy, which is associated with castles. Obviously, castles are not from fantasy. It's from actual real life in the medieval period. But bringing together the medieval period fantasy element, um, the wild American Wild West after the Civil War with, you know, people on horses and bad attitudes, and science fiction, which is a post-apocalyptic future world, bringing the imagery of these things together in a way that makes sense not just like Cowboys and Aliens, the movie, which I think was really underrated because it takes some real guts to do a Cowboys and Aliens movie, and it was really fun. So if you haven't seen it, go watch it. But not a um, thought experiment like that, but rather to say, actually, I think that's probably how it's actually going to be. There's a very reasonable 
argument for that. I need to learn about castles. I need to learn where they were, how they're built, how they're laid out, what the different parts of them are called, what parts would likely still be standing and what wouldn't, what the names are. And then I started getting ideas uh, as I started reading. I realized that some, because they're so old, some of these things, you know, they go back before Cervantes. Uh, they, um, or, 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 or Shakespeare, anybody else from the 1500s. Um, they go back to the 1400s, they're older, and you start realizing that fascinating people have been describing these, these facilities um, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And how interesting would it be if each time in the chapter, as a chapter began, and they move from one place to another, you got a description from somebody like let's say it's like Cervantes you know pulling into a castle outside of Madrid and it was described that one is described by Cervantes or this one in Italy is described by so-and-so or this one in France is described by so-and-so and I thought gosh that would be that would be fantastic wouldn't that be interesting it was just a couple of lines and what if those lines were evocative of what the chapter was going to be about. Can I do that? That's going to require a lot of homework to start cherry picking. This is not what scientists do, but it is what novelists do. Start cherry picking the lines out from the past that are that create that are a description of what you need it to be for your own story, for my own story. I thought that might be interesting. But to do that, I'm going to have to look, I'm going to have to read the original stuff in Spanish, Latin, uh, not Latin, well, maybe Latin, but Spanish, um, Italian, or French. So that's going to be a pain in the ass, maybe German, but I don't think my characters are going to go as far as that far north, but they've got a lot of great castles in Germany. So anyway, pulling back now, in the interest of time, research the creation of new knowledge is different from homework, which is stuff you need to know to get your job done. Forget the creation of original knowledge. That's not your job. Might happen, but it's not your job. Your homework is going to fall into two basic varieties. Reconnoitering, or to reconnoiter, is to wander around in the material for a while. Could be crime fiction, could be romance, could be westerns. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what genre you're using. It doesn't matter if it's literary fiction. It doesn't matter. Find stuff that you feel is um, gives you information, gives you mood, gives you uh, sense, sensual information. What do things sound like, smell like, taste like? Um, and start taking notes. They're going to be formless. They're going to be patternless. They're not directed towards anything yet. You don't know what you need to know. You can use Evernote. You can use a notebook. You can use scraps of paper. I don't care what your method is but start to gather things that that if you're looking for criteria it's something that inspires you does it inspire you does it a description of a rock does the sound of a, a, a of a the way that a hem is cut on a skirt it doesn't doesn't matter if you found it interesting somebody else will find it interesting that is the world moving through you as an artist in order to get out again as art so uh, trust your instincts the second one then is the purposive work is once you found, and we'll discuss that next part, finding the central tension of your novel, is once you know what your story is about and you've set characters in motion through acts and decisions, which is pretty much what needs to happen. People have to do things and choose things. If that's not happening in your novel, you have a boring, boring novel. And it could be, again, it could be about a, a, a girl who's unable to sell matchsticks in the cold, which sounds pretty dull, but turns out it's a good story. Choices need to be made. Purposively, you're going to go off into the world, find the things that now you're saying, in order to write that convincingly, I need to know this. There is a potential bottomless pit about when to stop investigating. We can talk about that another time, but there comes a point where what you're mainly doing is you're procrastinating from writing. If you've reached a saturation point where you actually know a fair amount of this to advance your story, not to perfectly write the scene, but to advance your story, it's time to go write your story. Because here's the thing, 
after you finish that first draft, you might not need that scene at all. You may not actually need to know how nuclear bombs work. You will not know until your first, is dra first draft is done what needs to come out of your book to keep the story advancing quickly. So here you don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good enough. It needs to be good enough, but once it is good enough, stop with the research and get on with it and get writing. That's it, 20 minutes. I'm, 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 I'm hitting it. Hope you learned something. Talk to me about it. Or at least if you learned something, you learned something about me. But hopefully you learned something about writing. Bye.